everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, my name is Tracy Hutchins. I'm the Executive Director of the Hanover Chamber of Commerce. And today we have with us uh, our local House representatives uh, for the New Hampshire Legislature, uh, representing the Hanover and Lyme area. Um, with us down here we have uh, Sharon Nordren, um, and then we have Polly Campion, and Representative Patricia Higgins, and Representative Mary Jane Mulligan. Uh, so we're going to start by, um, I'd like to just go down the uh, table here and have you all talk a little bit about what you're doing in the House, the committees that you sit on, um, bills that you're working on, and, and uh, things that you have introduced for this session. So Sharon, would you like to start? Thank you for coming. Um, I've been in the house, um, I'm going on my 30th year. Um, there are people who've been there longer than I have. Um, and um, I'm on the finance committee. Um, I started out on the children and youth committee and was there four years and then um, since 92 I've been on the finance committee. Um, so every two years, the state does a new budget. So um, the first year of our session, which was last year, um, we came up with the state budget. The governor prepares the budget the, after the departments give them their proposal, and the governor presents it to the House. Um, finance bills originate in the House. So the House Finance Committee has the budget for a number of weeks. We have hearings around the state, and then we bring it to the House floor. Um, in New Hampshire, unlike Vermont and Congress, bills don't get lost in committees. Every bill in New Hampshire has a discussion in a committee. The committee brings a recommendation to the House floor, Senate floor, and it has a vote. Um, we have calendars that we have for every week, and when we have the House session, there, there is a packet of bills that are not controversial, that have unanimous votes. Those are voted on as a package in the consent calendar. And then we dis debate and discuss every other bill on the calendar that's been brought forth from the committee. Uh, we have deadlines um, by which everything has to be done and we have crossover which passes all the house bills to the senate to the senate bills to the house bill so that's at, towards the end of march so then they do this the same process they make amendments they mess with our bills and then there might be a committee of conference that gets together a few people from each body and then we decide um, how that will come out, and that then is voted by the House and Senate. Okay. So last year we did the budget, and the Finance Committee worked on that for weeks and weeks, five days a week. Very good. Well, okay, we'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, Polly, would you like yeah, to take it away? Thank you, Tracy. Um, I am a first-term representative and uh, a registered nurse by background. Last year, I served on a, a committee called Executive Departments and Administration, which really is responsible for uh, good governance, I like to say, oversight of all of the executive uh, branch um, departments and governmental agencies. Um, and my particular interest in that effort had to do with occupational licensing. Mm -hmm. This year, I had the good fortune to have been asked to move to Health, Human Services, and Elderly Affairs. Um, which is a, a set of topics very close to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, again, one of the things, one of the bills that is working its way through our committee right now um, has to do with uh, reauthorizing Medicaid expansion. Um, and we can talk about that in a little bit greater detail as we go forward. Great. Um, but my, my focus, and as it turns out, fortunately many of the bills that come through our committee have to do with creating safety nets um, for vulnerable populations of one sort or another. Um, so here it's been 
fascinating process. Mm -hmm. And I'm learning all manner of things I had no idea existed. Awesome. Thank you, Polly. <laughs> Patricia. Thank you. Um, I am in my third term in the House. Um, I have a lifelong passion regarding uh, energy efficient transportation, and I lobbied beforehand to get into the right committee, which is Public Works and Highways. Mm. Um, Sharon's committee deals with the operating budget every two years. Um, our committee reviews the capital budget for the entire state. Um, so that's one huge bill, <laughs> and we get about a dozen other bills each year. Um, so once a term, we have the capital budget. The second year, uh, is we review the 10-year transportation plan. So we received that this week um, and are beginning to uh, get information from the Department of Transportation about how this is going to work, always with a constrained budget, lots of um, unknowns in terms of the federal level of uh, money coming in. Um, may I, did you want to hear about a, a particular bill? Certainly. Um, as you probably all know, the our highways and bridges are funded through the uh, a, a road toll on each gallon of gas that's sold in the state. Um, as you can imagine, over the last 20 years, as cars get better mileage, that is decreasing. So we are each year faced with a declining uh, income for the roads and highways. So this year there are two bills which are attempting to address that. Um, and one of them is um, sort of a blunt force. The proposal is simply to slap, excuse me, I shouldn't say that. <laughs> Simply to impose a uh, registration fee each year for um, hybrids, which would be $100 a year, and for uh, electric vehicles at $200 a year. The first few years, that's not going to get the state much money because there are not that many vehicles of that nature. Um, but this is in preparation for the future. As we all know, it's going to be uh, more and more electric, electrified transportation. Um, the other bill is not in my committee, but I've paid a lot of attention to it, and it's a much more sophisticated um, analysis, and it takes into account simply the efficiency of your car, not whether it's a hybrid or, a, or an electric, whatever else. Um, so those are the two bills that I'm paying a lot of attention to. And uh, yeah. Great. All right. Mary Jane? Yes. Hi. Uh, my name is Mary Jane Mulligan. And uh, thank you, Tracy, for organizing this and for everybody uh, to be uh, attending it. Um, I also am a first term uh, uh, state rep from Lyme in Hanover. Uh, Polly and I came on together. Um, so this is my second um, session of this first term. Um, the first year, I was in the Judiciary Committee. Um, I'm a non-practicing attorney, and um, uh, I, I really wanted to get into the Children and Family Law uh, Committee. Um, and I thought I would be a, you know, kind of a natural for that because actually when I was practicing law, I was a, an attorney for abused and neglected children. So, and I have like a you know, real passion for that area. But because of some of the issues, I don't know if anybody remembers, but uh, last uh, year, uh, DCYF was having some issues and our Children and Family Law yeah. Committee was having some issues and they, the, uh, the speaker did away with the uh, committee and then the House brought it back. Uh, so, and in the meantime, um, uh, uh, it wasn't available to, basically, to new, uh, to newbies, to uh, first-termers, to, to uh, get into that um, 
um, committee, and I won't go into the details of that. But anyway, so I was I was on the judiciary, and the judici judiciary was you know was very very exciting. We had lots of bills that came through. It was a very busy, busy committee. Um, you know, it, it does a lot with probate issues, and it does a lot with um, non-criminal um, civil cases. And, um, and so it was, you know, a very lively committee and uh, really, I, you know, became very, um, you know, got a lot of experience from that. But then at the beginning of this session, I got a phone call from the uh, Democratic leader uh, saying, uh, would I like to join the Children and Family Law Committee? And I just jumped on that. I thought that was, you know, I was so excited. It was, it's my passion. So, um, so we've only had one hearing so far. Uh, in the Children and Family Law, and that hearing was really based on a number of different bills that were coming in to raise the um, child marriage um, age from 13 up to what this term, we're raising it to 16 because we tried doing it last year and it was killed in the house. We tried raising it from the marriage age from 13 for girls, 14 for boys, up to 18. But because of some um, uh, conflicting interest um, from various groups, uh, when it finally hit the house, it was um, uh, what was killed, essentially, it was ITL'd. So we brought the bill back again for this term, but we couldn't use the 18-year-old age limit. We had to um, lower it um, to 16. So this year, there's going to be a lot of bills uh, that are focusing on raising the age from 13 up to 16. The, this is something that's been in the news quite a bit yes. recently. Yes. Well, that's good. Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I think most people, you know, most people when I ask them, my constituents and other people, had no idea that um, New Hampshire uh, allowed 13 and 14 year olds. I mean, they do need their parents' permission, they do, do need a judge, but even that, um, you know, isn't perfect and it doesn't protect our children. So is, is this a bill that you see that will pass fairly easily? Well, actually last term it passed okay. in the House. I mean, it passed in, I mean, I'm sorry, it was unanimous uh, in the committee. The Children and Family Law Committee uh, had bipartisan support. It passed unanimously. And we thought it was going to be just, you know, just a quick vote in the House. But then uh, people came forward and made arguments uh, against um, having uh, the age limit up to 18. And there are, are various arguments. Uh, that get a little complicated, but um, because of those arguments that they made at the well on the day that we were doing the voting, uh, they changed a, you know, a number of people's minds and people voted against raising the marriage age to 18. And as I said, because of the, um, the various, um, uh, uh, the ways that it was handled over um, in last session, we weren't allowed to bring the 18-year uh, age limit, so we had lowered it to 16. We may try again. If, you know, hopefully we'll pass it this go around. But if uh, and if we do pass it, you know, there, we may try tweaking it again to get back up to the 18 when we're allowed to bring that bill back. Great. Great. Well. It seems like it would be a slam dunk, but I, I'm sure there always are, you know, a lot of differing opinions and backgrounds that come into play when you're looking at something like this. Well, that's exactly the way I felt. I thought it was a <laughs> no-brainer, slam dunk, but apparently that wasn't the case. But hopefully this one is more successful. Great, great. And one of the things, in case everyone doesn't know, there are 400 members in the New Hampshire House, 24 in the Senate. The House is the third largest English-speaking body in the world. <laughs> so obviously, when you have a bill, it's hard to figure out what might happen <laughs> when it finally gets to the floor. 
and what's going on in the background and who's talking to who and yeah. right lots of opinions yeah, right. right and and we should say that um, uh, state senator um, Martha Hennessy was supposed to be here today unfortunately she's not feeling well um, because we were going to have our senator um, represented as well. Um, okay, I'd like to um, ask you about some of the, the things that you're working on. And uh, Polly, you had talked about um, uh, working on the uh, Health and Human Services Committee. And of course, you know, as a, as a Chamber of Commerce and um, made up of business members throughout the community, we're very concerned about what's happening in business and economic development in the state and workforce is a huge issue in New, New Hampshire, Vermont, all through New England as a matter of fact. Um, so right now um, SB 344 is a bill that uh, seeks to grant temporary licensure of allied health professionals that are relocating <laughs> from other states. Um, and I remember from last year there was a very similar bill, but it was uh, just for LNAs. Uh, it was actually for everyone licensed by the Board of Nursing. So oh, okay. LNAs, RNs, LPNs. Great, well. thank you. Which, of course, there's a shortage in our state of and, and other health professionals as well. Um, so this one is looking at uh, health professionals such as occupational therapists and physical therapists. And uh, from what I hear, it's, it's kind of an odious process if you're moving from another state to come to this state and it takes quite a while to get your license transferred and to be granted a license to practice in New Hampshire. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about where the bill is going and how you see it developing? I, I can, actually I'm a co-sponsor in that bill. Mm -hmm. right. um, and that was brought by Senator Kahn from the Keene uh, region, um, and it is modeled, uh, the one, the Allied Health Bill 344 is, is modeled on the, uh, the nursing bill that you had mentioned, Tracy. Um, and just to step back for a minute, um, I, had a, I had a discussion with uh, Bill Chief Freddy about this bill a few minutes ago, um, as a matter of fact. Um, they, there is a wide perception that it's difficult to get a license to practice any number of things, um, any number of occupations in the state of New Hampshire. And there are, there are some good reasons for that and there are some uh, barriers that exist that, that in process that can be eliminated. And this bill seeks to eliminate some of the barriers in process without lowering the standards. Um, New Hampshire, in many cases, does have expectations for licensure that are higher than other states. And so when somebody comes in having a license from another state, there's a process for determining that there's rough equivalence between what they have done and what they are doing. For instance, there are some states that don't require a criminal background check prior to licensure. And that's something we kind of draw the line on <laughs> here for um, people who are touching, touching patients in particular. Um, the bill that you reference actually um, just passed the Senate yesterday. So it started in the Senate, went to the, their executive departments and administration committee, passed there with one, re, one amendment and passed the full Senate yesterday. And what it does is allow um, or enable individuals who are currently licensed in one of a number of neighboring states um, as occupational therapists, physical therapists, um, an occupational assistant, a physical therapy assistant, um, I believe audiologists are in that, that bill, and help me remember what else might be there, and speech, speech uh, pathologist. Uh, pathologist as well. And for individuals who hold a license in New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island was just added, Massachusetts, Maine, or Vermont, um, they are now enabled to come in and practice on a temporary license pretty quickly um, and have 120 days, I believe, to um, go through the actual uh, licensing process um, in order to, to gain a New Hampshire license to practice. And it, it, the hope is that it will bring people in, again, particularly from the neighboring states. Um, we have borders um, with Vermont and um, Massachusetts in particular 
uh, Maine to some degree, in which there are professionals who practice in both states or would like to practice in both states but are challenged because of that. Um, so the hope is that that will increase um, the number of people practicing in those areas, which are shortage areas. Wonderful. Do you see any obstructions that might pop up for this? Or? I think the only thing that might happen in the House Committee, again, Executive Departments and Administration, which was what I had sat on <laughs> last year, um, people are pretty uh, good at looking at the detail. Um, and I'll have to say, I don't know if Sharon agrees with this or not, but my observation has been that the House Committees, um, because there are there are more members, and each um, most members of the House sit on one committee only, as opposed to the senators that sit on multiple committees. Um, they pay a lot of attention to the detail, um, and that it's so. Uh, but I don't see there being any major um, obstacles. Great. Um, going along with the workforce uh, theme, and I, I don't think uh, there's three bills that are coming up that. Uh, have to do with workforce and the shortage in New Hampshire. I, I don't think uh, any of you sponsored them, but um, presumably they'll come to a vote before the full House at some point. Um, so there's uh, HB 1100 that's looking to establish a commission to evaluate workforce and job training. And then along that line, SB 567 is looking to expand job training programs that are already offered by the Department of Resources and Economic Development, such as the Job Training Fund, which I, I think is uh, it's fairly well utilized already in the state, although there are still quite a few employers that are not aware of what it actually does. Um, but this seeks to expand that funding so that they can do a little bit more with the uh, fund. And then SB 75 is looking to establish a tax credit against business profits tax if a business donates to a career or technical education center. Um, you know, of course, we don't know where those bills are going yet, but uh, I do believe a couple of those may have been held over from last session, or they were first introduced and then uh, tabled for more study. So can you, any of you comment on, on those and where you see, uh, you know, how important workforce is and that topic for our state right now? Yeah, well, the workforce training was something that we tried to get in the budget um, in the Finance Committee. Um, the TANF population, temporary aid for needy families population, um, there was a proposal by the Health and Human Services Department to put funding in their budget for workforce training. But unfortunately, the other members of the Finance Committee took it out. So that was something we tried to get happening. Um, the last bill that you mentioned seems like it could have difficulty. Uh, the but, tax credit against, yeah, yeah, uh, right, yeah. for uh, donations to career and technical right. education yeah. centers. It seems a little complicated. Yeah, so <clears throat> what happens after the first year, there might be a bill that the House or Senate says they want to mm -hmm. do um, study on it. So it stays in the committee. They look at it over the summer, and then they bring it back to the floor of the House or Senate and we, we dealt with some of those bills a week ago, but we didn't finish, so we're going back February 7th. But otherwise, at the end of this year session, if there's a bill they want to study, it's um, put to interim study, which sort of means you're killing the bill. But you can study it, but you have to bring in a new bill next year. So that's a little process. Otherwise, mm -hmm. I don't know much about the bills you were talking about. Okay. Um, and when it comes to workforce, so there's, you know, these three bills are all looking at making funding available for more training. Is that going to be the magic bullet, you think, that helps serve our, you know, solve our workforce issues? That would help, but obviously it didn't pass in the budget. So one of the problems with trying to fund something in this year, um, we already have a state budget. It lasts for two years. Mm -hmm. um, we would be reopening the budget 
to try to find money for that program. We have a rainy day fund, we have a surplus, but there are those members who are, you know, don't want to touch that. So if it's money needing for something, that, that's a problem this year. Great. Polly, you look like you have something to add. But Patricia, okay. I've already yeah. spoken, so Patricia yeah. has just, yeah. just very briefly, this um, we have a number of arguments about workforce training and funding of mm -hmm. it. What's interesting to me is um, that we have the entire educational system that leads up to a young person deciding whether to do um, training in a particular field, whatever. Um, and that's sort of been a disappointment that there's not more um, emphasis on developing the workforce from the beginning. We right. do have pre-K, pre-kindergarten now, which um, from my understanding of the research it shows benefits for the individual all the way through their lives. So. Right. Hopefully. Right. We'll see that developing. Right, there's a, a, a perception that um, uh, college track is the only way to go right. f for, you know, uh, some schools. Right. And, uh, um, of course, we do have some tech centers around the area, and they do wonderful work right. with, you know, trying to broaden the scope in terms of, you know, uh, every kinds of, you know, occupational type of training. Um, but they, they seem to, they, they kind of have a little stutter start at times, and, and it's more of a perception problem right. uh, with parents and students. Is, is, would you say that's correct? Um, I don't know about the perception okay. aspect. Mm -hmm. What I am aware of um, when we deal with the capital budget, um, it is very refreshing to see that there are some certain cycles that get built in to uh, funding the uh, regional uh, tech centers so that uh, it, it's not a fresh fight every time about uh, funding you know, these three. It is on sort of <clears throat> a cycle so that every year we take, I believe it's two tech centers and uh, develop, uh, give them capital money to um, further their, their programs. And that's very refreshing to see some investment over the years in those programs. Great. Awesome. Oh, Polly, go ahead. Well, like, I guess you had asked about whether or not we thought that um, training was the, the key to workforce development. And I guess to take a somewhat broader view when there are, there are bills that address each one of these aspects, um, many of which I won't be able to talk about in detail. But if we think about the, the fact that we have a gap in the number of highly qualified individuals to work in, in a number of different fields. Um, it involves both um, preparing people who currently live here right, <laughs> to work in those fields <laughs> and providing, having housing available for them to move into when they decide to work here, um, retaining those people within the state so that we have to be more attractive and all, and all that that means than other other states, particularly those that are um, close to us, and um, providing benefits that enable people to continue to work in our state, um, even should they run into uh, health challenges or other other challenges, um, and uh, I think I talked about attracting people in, but uh, so it's preparing, housing, paying, benefiting retaining and attracting. <laughs> it, it, it's a much more complicated problem than, you know, more funding for education, which is important, but so many other factors from our housing stock and our population aging and, and our young yes. students moving out of the state. Um, there's there's a, a lot to this problem. There are a couple of bills. Um, <laughs> And just thinking about uh, benefits for people who are in the area, you may have heard that the House passed uh, uh, essentially an insurance option for individuals to have paid um, family medical leave up to 12 weeks, um, and that, that did pass the House. It's now um, in the Senate. 
or to finance. <coughs> No, it's yeah. in commerce. In commerce. In commerce. Oh, okay. That's a little riskier. Well, they yeah. deal with insurance. <laughs> yeah. um, and every year, every uh, budget season, um, loan repayment um, funding comes up um, for particular uh, occupations. Um, nursing has been one that has benefited in the past. Um, additional funding for loan repayment programs has been uh, demonstrated to attract and retain individuals um, if they can work in New Hampshire and um, have a little uh, relief from their um, student loans. Well, while we're sort of following this thread, um, Polly, you had talked about working on a bill for Medicaid expansion. Um, can you elaborate a little bit and tell us more about how that might fit into this picture? And this is a bill, um, for, I'm not a co-sponsor, but it's in our committee in Health and Human Services. And it, um, as most people know if you read anything or watch any television, um, Medicaid expansion was authorized uh, and implemented now three and a half years ago, um, associated with the Affordable Care Act. Um, in New Hampshire, the, the program is designed for um, adults 19 to 64 year olds who would not otherwise qualify for Medicaid. So it's not the program for kids, it's not um, an additional program. The income cap for recipients is 138% of the po federal poverty level, and 138% is 16245 dollars annually, which is not very much money. Um, over the three and a half years, there have been um, about 120,000 unique individuals who have participated in, in the program, um, with 52,000 individuals currently enrolled. And the gap between the, the ever have participated and the, the current is that um, to a large degree, the program has done what it was intended to do, and that is to say that individuals, 65% of these recipients are working. Um, so it's not that people are sitting home with nothing going on, um, but they may be people who are working at, at uh, jobs that have no benefits um, and have a catastrophic event that results in their not being able to work for a period of time they enroll in the um, patient protection program um, for a temporary period of time, and I think the average is nine to 10 months. And then when they are healed and well and able to go back to work, um, are no longer in the program. Um, one of the most striking things about this particular program is that uh, roughly 10% of all participants have access substance use or mental health services to which they previously had not had access. Um, and that's equivalent to about 23,000 individuals over the last three and a half years. And um, I think I, I talked about the number that were already working. The impact of the program has been pretty dramatic as well. We heard from the um, New Hampshire Hospital Association that um, it has data from all 26 acute care hospitals. And hospitals have seen a 45% reduction in uninsured inpatient admissions during this time. That's significant. Which is dramatic. Um, a 39% reduction in emergency department visits, again, by uninsured. Um, and a 45% reduction in uninsured outpatient visits. Um, so the, the amount of uncompensated care that is provided that we all pay for in different ways has dramatically been reduced. Um, the program right now is scheduled to expire um, uh, December 31st of this year, if not reauthorized. Um, and the, the bill to reauthorize does a couple of things. Um, it actually takes the expiration date out completely um, because we would at any point in time with six months advance notice be able to withdraw from the program. So there's no need to have an expiration date. We have to continually determine to continue. Um, it also aligns recognizing that work requirements and based on federal guidance um, and sort of the state of what is occurring, um, <coughs> this bill would align work requirements with both the New Hampshire um, temporary uh, assistance to needy families, TANF, as well as federal um, requirements. 
Um, and it does one other thing that's designed both to improve patient outcomes but also to save funds, and that is to move um, individuals who qualify for the program who have medically complex needs um, into a managed care program rather than um, being enrolled in the commercial market. Um, and it does two things. It offers them additional services for continuity of care um, and may have less of an impact on the other individuals who are enrolled through the marketplace. Um, I think those are the things. So we would, it's, it's had a tremendous impact not only in the individuals who've had access to it, um, but to it enable additional people to continue working, um, to have treatment that enables them to be uh, productive in the future. Yes, please, sure. Just to add one yeah. thing, um, that was a very good job. Okay. <laughs> um, Thanks. <laughs> the bill as it was written originally, um, there was all 100% federal funding, but now the federal funding is going down. so. The original bill that was passed two years ago um, said that no general funds could be used for this program, and now this new bill takes that section out so that general funds could be used. So that's part of the quandary, and that's why it'll go to the Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. So if there are any bills that have fiscal notes, they go to the first committee, and then Finance Committee is the second committee. So we get to go through all this, but just dealing right. with the financial right. part that then would take money from the general fund. Right. Um, I want to open it up to, does anyone here from the audience have any questions? I Tim. Have one question, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, was talking about the problem of attracting people or maintaining people in the state. I'm more interested, how about this area? Because <laughs> you're all representing right, this right, area. Right, right. And, and that's it. I mean, I see attracting people to the hospital. And, and I'm thinking right now of probably more skilled things than jobs than what we're talking. Uh, I'm all for, the, um, I think Hypertherm has its own uh, training purposes. But, doctors, uh, professors, uh, big companies, no uh, orders coming, coming in, things like that. How do we attract people and keep people in this area? I would ask others to contribute <laughs> to that too. <laughs> there were a silver bullet, I think we would have uh, implemented. Um, I do, um, I have opinions about that, um, which include the, um, in our immediate area, in Hanover and Lyme, the cost of living is very high. Um, and affordable housing is, 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 is a real challenge and one thing that um, I think we need to invest more in. Um, I do think um, things such as loan repayments, um, would help uh, professional, again, thinking about nurses or people who are not the highest paid um, in an area, um, those kinds of programs would, uh, would attract people. Um, and I'm looking to my colleagues as well, what I'm aware of anecdotally, there being um, a challenge for people who come not by themselves, but with a partner. Um, and sometimes it's difficult for both members of a, of a couple to find um, the right match. I don't know what the solution to that is, but services to help the, the trailing partner um, may, may assist that. Um, but other? I was thinking, um, I, I read the article about Joanne Conroy, the new person, yeah. doctor in charge of our DHMC, and one of the things she mentioned was Another hospital, I don't remember where, was having housing for some of its employees on site. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there's plenty of space over there by the hospital, um, partnering with another group or other mm -hmm. institutions might be a way to at least get some new housing. I mean, obviously, we have a lot of old housing, right. it's very expensive, but if we could have something that would be particularly for part of the workforce they need that might be helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, any other opinions? Well, um, you know, I guess one um, aspect would just, um, you know, make New Hampshire uh, a family-friendly state that would attract people. And generally, New Hampshire is thought of as a, a family-friendly <laughs> state. Uh, but, uh, you know, with the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I have members of my family in Maryland that are a little scared of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we really need to turn that around. Mm -hmm. We really need to, um, uh, you know, get a handle on that. I mean, the, you know, we've had the president mention uh, New Hampshire as a state that uh, is in trouble with the opioid crises in certain terms. And um, and then you know we have these the uh, the 13 year olds and 14 year olds we have laws that allow 13 and 14 year olds to get married. I mean, how do, do you feel comfortable moving into a state where that kind of law is on the uh, on the books? And actually, I have um, you know I don't know this is a little stretch here, but um, I moved from the Washington D.C. area up here mm -hmm. over 20 years ago. And in, in Washington, D.C., in every state that I had ever lived in, California, uh, Virginia, um, every state that I moved into, we had a seatbelt uh, law. And uh, here, we, I move up to New Hampshire. I don't realize you don't have a seatbelt law up here, or we don't have a seatbelt law up here in New Hampshire. And I move here, I have a six-year-old daughter. And at that time, there wasn't even a seatbelt law for children. So it's, you know, so I moved up here, I was like horrified to know that um, there weren't you know, seatbelt laws for <laughs> children and adults. And then we finally, when they finally did vote in for children, you know, I was, you know, relieved. But at the same time, um, you know, there was a problem that there was uh, lots of adults that were not wearing seatbelts. So I actually, uh, you know, and that contributes to a family-friendly environment you know knowing that the you know that everybody is being safe and responsible so I did uh, this year um, as a first termer I am sponsoring a seat belt bill for adults and um, and it's you know I'm oh, how much for the well I you know it's on <laughs> one step at a time exactly <laughs> exactly um, we need helmets uh, for the our motorcyclists um, and I'm, I'm just doing an in increments. The last time that a seatbelt bill was uh, brought to the attention of the House was nine years ago. So nine, for nine years, uh, people have been, uh, you know, getting away with not wearing seatbelts in the state. And I have, like, you know, I have um, eight organizations that are supporting uh, the uh, requirement of wearing seatbelts. Uh, so there are eight, uh, it's called the New Hampshire Seatbelt Coalition. There are eight organizations that are uh, going to be testifying on behalf of, um, you know, getting a seatbelt requirement law here in New Hampshire. So I think those are, you know, just those are <coughs> other reasons um, that we need to tackle to uh, bring people to the area so that they feel uh, comfortable living here. Have you ever thought of working with the police in Vermont and Massachusetts to sit on the border when the, the non seat up people cross? I, 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 you know, quite honestly, I have considered that because does a person who does not wear a seatbelt in a New Hampshire, when they go into another state, do they buckle up? No, they don't buckle up, more than likely. Yeah. <laughs> That's a cheap way of it. Right. Right. Could I, there's a, there's a, there's a question, question in the back. Uh, I have a couple of things. First, um, you know, I really hope that your bill does pass for the age of 16. I think it should be 18. I guess I'm very on that aspect. But as uh, family law, you stated um, that, like, you're, you're in family law. And it's mind-boggling to me that a 13-year-old cannot go up on stand and testify who they want to live with, whether the mom or what's going on, and that the court system gets involved and they make the choice. So you have that aspect where 
no, a kid's not mature enough at the age of 13. Now it's 14, they moved it up. But in New Hampshire, you can get married when you're 13, right. and, and that's okay. Right. You know, so I, I really hope that does pass, and I hope other things with young children that they can more advocates for themselves when it comes to family, family law, that they'll be able to speak with how they want to speak and, and kind of give their opinions so that everyone can collaborate and together and make the decision based on the kids needs, not the parents needs as well. So I, I really hope that that does pass. I did have a question about the increase of hybrids, of like tacking on 100 or 200 dollar bills, uh, dollars to the New Hampshire residents. Um, like you did indicate, it's very expensive to live. I mean, I live in London, I pay taxes, and it, it is very expensive uh, to live here. Um, so, I mean, if you look at the Lebanon statistics, it says that a population is about 15,000 people in, in, in Lebanon. And then during the weekday, it doubles to 30,000, let's say, um, of people coming in from different states or different uh, towns coming into Lebanon. Sorry, I'm just uh, focusing on Lebanon. But, you know, so I understand, like, our gas money's not coming in as much, but how how come we're responsible for the additional charges when we're already spending a lot of money in this area? Like, how can we tack on, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to discourage people coming into this area from Vermont, but how, like, don't you think that they should be responsible too for some of our roadways? You know what I mean? Like, I don't she's not here, so. <laughs> But I, I was just I was just curious sure she because it, it is expensive to live here and, and we do sacrifice some other things to be able to live here um, opposed to living in a different state. Um, you know, to register a car is very expensive in each year, so Unfortunately, the person who, yeah. who's most able to answer that has stepped out of the room for a minute. But, oh. Um, oh, maybe we can come back to that when she comes back in. Um, just just kind of going along with that a little bit, um, let's, let's talk a little bit about you know, high cost of energy, which also contributes to how expensive it is to live in New Hampshire. Um, and uh, was that also Patricia that's kind of in? I'm sorry. Oh, there she is. OK. And we have a couple questions. Yes. A couple yeah. questions. Okay, I had, had to catch Tim before he left. Okay. Um, well, from our audience, uh, the, the question was just asked about the uh, electric vehicle uh, mm -hmm. registration and and, mm -hmm. and and doing a uh, the the one hundred dollars or two hundred dollars. Um, my question is that over and above the cost of registering your car? Yep. So is so. Yep. Okay, and and Andrea, do you want to restate your question? Yeah, sorry. So what I was saying is, that, you know, you're you're involved with uh, the money for our roadways and our bridges. Um, so what I was saying is, it's very expensive to live in in this area. We have population of living about fifteen thousand during the weekday. It doubles because everybody right. comes in from different states. Um, they use our roadways as well. Mm -hmm. So. Why is it, why are we getting penalized for that extra annual fee when, you know, they're, they're able to live outside and not pay as much taxes and, and you know, and, and buy a house or whatever, but we're living here and we're paying a lot of taxes and it's expensive to live. Right. Um, to and purchase the car every year and, you know, even in Hanover and Aetna and Lyme and, and all that, so how are we, I mean, I wouldn't want to discourage anyone coming in to, to work in New Hampshire and spend money in New Hampshire right. and all of that. But like, why do we get penalized for the extra cost when they're using our roads to here? I, uh, I think your question is very good. It, it can be generalized to, I mean, I think Lebanon bears a lot of um, burden for the region. I mean, it is the economic center. Which is awesome. Which is awesome. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, but it does have that um, burden because it, the hospital, the college, hypertherm attract from a huge commuter shed. Um, that that's true. 
the only thing, I mean, you raise in, uh, one of the many factors that goes into trying to figure out how to equitably pay. I mean, ideally that would be on a regional basis. We could have regional agreements or maybe even federal arrangements so that all the, the uh, gas tax money goes to um, care for, for all the roads. Um, so I don't have anything specific. I was just curious. Right. Yeah. Because, I mean, we want hyper cars. We, we want all that in our area because of the yes. environment, you know? And I, I don't know, um, like, I know you need the money. I know you need the funding. It's right. great that we have those right. roadways and, you right. know, everybody from all over the place that come in. But, you know, wintertime, our roadways are amazing and they're, and they're very safe for all the travelers that come in, which is great. Right. Um, but it's just on the other fact, like, do by putting that extra expense, are we going to discourage people to buy the hyper cars? And I'll ask you. Yeah. <laughs> what do you all think? I mean, I've, I've probably tipped my. No, I'm just curious. I was just like, you know, like I'm not against anything, but I'm just curious right. because I'm sure people do ask right. those questions. Right. Right. Now. right. This is just beginning to work its way through, and. Um, I am perennially looking for a, a fairer way and one which does not um, discourage people from doing what's good for society, uh, even though it doesn't fill New Hampshire's coffers as efficient. Well, and I would just add, um, the Public Works Committee is in charge of the 10-year plan. Mm -hmm. um, so it would behoove Polly to make sure that the Upper Valley gets share of, mm -hmm. of the pot mm -hmm. for the Patricia. ten year plan. Oh yeah, right. Yeah. Oh. That's right. Yeah. 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 Oh no, yeah, that's right. not You're my charge yeah. of health care. She's in charge of roads. So <laughs> so but that's something, yeah. you know, we yes. we can look at as right. part of our right. duty to be right. your representatives in Concord right. is to make sure that our roads are getting fixed too and it's not just the North Country which yeah. actually has a huge problem. And, and Patricia, can you talk a little bit more about are, are there projects on the 10-year plan that are slated for this area? There are. Yeah. Um, the um, re, um, reconstruction of Mechanic Street in Lebanon uh, is on the list. You realize this is going out for 10 years and as every <laughs> T two years, we do a two, ten year plan. Um, it is very frustrating that we cannot move some of these forward, these projects, which will indeed, in the long run, save money. Because if you let a road deteriorate, it, um, I think if it, if it's reasonable condition, it's like a hundred thousand dollars to to care for a mile. If you let it really deteriorate, it's a million or to two million dollars per mile mm -hmm. to re to uh, reconstruct a road. Mechanic Street, I believe, has been on Lebanon's wish list yeah. mm -hmm. for years and years, and I, it looks like that may be moving forward. Uh, Tim Camarado had an article, I think, in today's Valley News, which does a review of mm -hmm. from the. Regional Planning Commission's perspective. Um, I've been involved with the Transportation Management Association um, and looking at regionally what we're available, what's available. Um, one of the things about being uh, a, a neighboring, a border town, is that 100 or two hundred years ago it was probably a, 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 a economically wise decision for New Hampshire to claim ownership of um, rivers, like the Connecticut River, okay? At this point, it's, it's more questionable. We are responsible for approximately 97% of bridge construction over the Connecticut River, and that's true for all the surrounding areas. Um, but that, you know, the Interstate 89 between uh, Lebanon and Hartford is going to be on our uh, bill. Uh, 
um, and we receive much less money um, than, than we possibly could. We can't invest. It's like it's always repairing, and that's, mm -hmm. that's something that I, I would love to bring to the, to the house, this concept shouldn't be surprised, but investment so that you eventually save money. But. So I, I know that it's been in the works for a very long time, and we've heard things about the Iron Force project in West Lebanon, and, and I believe what I read for the city of Lebanon, it did pass votes for the new uh, traffic flow down in West Lebanon. Is that true? Is that forward or do you know any I, I know it's probably more of a Lebanon type of thing, but right. we're talking about Mechanic Street and right. that's kind of part of it. Is is that gonna happen? I can't I am not familiar enough uh, to be able to answer that. I know good. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, Billy you had a question. Yeah, I just um, I wanted to thank you all for coming. Um, it's really nice to be able to be this close to be able to speak one on one with our Representatives. One of my comments is um, in looking at um, the state of our society and, and our interactions with one another on a national level, but also on a state level. And reading the letters to the editor in the Batman News, um, there's certainly a real loss of civility, and I would I would strongly support and encourage you all to really demonstrate that kind of real civility and appreciating other people's viewpoints. And from talking with you here today, you certainly seem like those kind of, that kind of a person that will help to make things you know, solve problems because you can appreciate people have different viewpoints mm -hmm. and if they genuinely really want to help, then we have to understand each other's viewpoints. But um, I, I have to say I appreciate the way that you're presenting yourselves today. Um, Paul, your, your information was about the, the, the real objective information, what you shared was a great example without a lot of rhetoric. Um, I mean, it's, it's great if, if um, our local leaders here are part of the you know, real leadership in the sense of their behavior at the state level. Um, I would be very proud of that. Um, anything else here? My other couple questions would be um, if there's easy ways for um, us to be able to follow what are the bills that, that are coming up, that would be great for me to know that. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's anything else that you have any comment on your school choice or school funding. There, uh, there, is, there, there is a bill in the Finance Committee now. Um, the school voucher bill, it's Senate Bill 193. Um, we had a hearing the other day which lasted probably six hours. <laughs> um, it already had been to the Education Committee and it barely passed there, but it passed the House floor, I think, by 20 votes. Um, the Finance Committee is just looking at the financial part. So that's, I think, where you know, the policy committee looked at the policy and maybe that seems fine, but the financial part is looking a little sketchy. So I think that's, um, there isn't a lot of accountability in it. There's a separate organization dealing with the funding and handing it out to the parents. It's not run by the Department of Education, which is sort of a misnomer. Um, so there are a lot of issues we're delving into now. We've had other work sessions um, in our committee on the bill, so we'll have a hearing and then we'll have a work session. So the committee's already had one work session and we'll be having others too, but um, I don't know if it might be amended or maybe it'll be held back for interim study so people can look at it more over the summer. But I think a lot of the people who maybe put the bill together, we're more, more concerned about the philosophy of it and the policy rather than the financial part. And the experts on our committee and our legislative budget office has come up with a lot of 
questions that we don't think the bill answers. Um, the Department of Education was asked for a fiscal note, which they would give to our uh, uh, legislative budget department, and then they come up with a page attached to a bill that said this is the fiscal impact. The Department of Education will only give us one-year projections, which doesn't really answer the question about what happens five or ten years from now. So that's going to be a big issue we'll be talking about for a few weeks in finance. And just uh, as an overview, and I, uh, every time someone expresses interest in knowing what bills, um, it you know warms the cockles <laughs> of our hearts. There is a actually a terrific website at New Hampshire General Court, NH General Court, and probably for anybody, mm -hmm. it, it will be. Uh, I think it's fairly intuitive going through. It is packed with all the information. That, that you could possibly wish. And because we, as a state, are very concerned about transparency, um, there's a lot there to take a look at. So I'd be happy to help if people yeah. have and, specific questions. Yeah, and there's one little part where you can go to the House of Representatives, and then you can go to the House calendars. The House calendars look like this, and they come out weekly. And then you can look at all the bills that are going to be heard for the next few yeah. weeks. So if there's any bill you're interested in, you could contact one of us. We could give you the info. You could go down and testify. Yeah. 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 It's very and useful. And my, that's exactly what I was just going to talk about, is yeah. that this uh, uh, general uh, the general court website. Oh, I'm so sorry. Very sorry. Um, the general court website is uh, uh, the best place to go because you can find out exactly mm -hmm. how people voted because there's also a section you can go to called the roll call vote. Mm -hmm. And you can look down there and you can see how your representatives voted on various issues. So, uh, you know, I really do, as everybody else here has said, really do recommend uh, becoming familiar with that because uh, there is just so much local information that is so hard to get um, in any other format. I mean, WMUR, you know, does a, you know, does, you know, tries to get the information out there, but it's limited. And also, NHPR, uh, you know, tries to get the information out there too. But um, there is a lot going on in the state house. Um, as a first year, first termer, uh, you know, I am just, you know, so, um, you know overwhelmed and uh, surprised by all the in, all the bills and all the things that are going on in New Hampshire and so I really do encourage people to uh, you know to go to that website and explore it and if you have any questions don't hesitate to call any of us if you also if you any um, if you have any question uh, have an issue and you think there should be a bill about it contact your representative and discuss that with the representative that child marriage bill that was a 17-year-old high school student who had heard about the 13 and 14-year-old marriages. She contacted her state rep. Her state rep worked with her uh, to bring this bill uh, yeah. to the House. So um, it, it, those issues that you have with uh, Lebanon uh, regarding uh, some of the uh, infrastructure uh, issues um, uh, and cost, like you were mentioning, um, tap into your state, um, your state reps, and let them know your concerns and if there is a bill that they can um, help you with. And on that website, all of your contact information is there as well, right? Yeah. Question. Alan. A question or comment as well. I echo the comments of Bill on my appreciation for the work you do and taking the time this morning. Uh, for us, one of the topics that was important was uh, affordable housing, but I think, Holly, as you mentioned, it's a very, um, it's a multifaceted issue that, that really needs to be solved. I, I'd say that for any of you, I, I sort of jotted down notes as to where your areas of, uh, and, you know, uh, work have to be in Concord, but look to the, to the co-op, reach out to me at any time because we would at least like to be a part of, of, of trying to solve the issue. And I would just say that there is some good news that happens out there in the state. Um, New Hampshire has the highest 
per capita rate of uh, resident-owned communities. Those are trailer uh, mobile home parks that have been transferred into cooperative ownership. It, it's a massive success story because formerly people who live in those parks only own their trailer. They don't own the land. They have no equity. There is no collateral there for them to be able to do other things. And the success stories are remarkable. There's a couple just within this region that happened in the last couple of years. Up in Berlin, Vermont, 50 residents managed, with the help of cooperative associations, to conduct a $2.1 million purchase of their park. But my point of concern is with that model, and it's not a it's not a deep concern, but I asked you to sort of think about it more long term, is that they pulled it off because they worked very closely with Cooperative Development Institute, which is a it's based in Massachusetts. So there was financial expertise. They also worked with Rock USA, which is resident-owned communities. It's based in New Hampshire, huge success story, but they're helping to bridge the finance. And it's not just, okay, here's the financing and here's the expertise, you sign the, the note, see you later. They're staying involved to make sure that now there's a successful cooperative and people now own their financial future. So could be more of a model to really look at as we talk about affordability. And not only can you afford to find a home, you can afford to stay in that home. So grants are, you know, a lot of these organizations work on grant funding, and we know that can be dicey in some ways. So. I just have a, another a good news grant story, actually. Just yesterday, the, Senate, the, the House had previously passed and the Senate just passed yesterday a bill to address lead poisoning um, for, for children that uh, lowers the, the acceptable level um, uh, at which it uh, changes the threshold at which uh, attention needs to be paid and, and intervention needs to occur, but also creates a grant program for landlords. Um, to engage in um, abatement um, right. for lead paint and other services, very, very which can be very expensive. Right, right. So it's that's a, a good news it's story. It's a loan program. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. Loan program. <laughs> but but this is an example <laughs> yes. of nonpartisan yeah. working together, right. which right. doesn't happen very often in Concord. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. was brought to the Senate by a Concord senator. They spent the summer looking at it. Then the Finance Committee in the House got it, and the Republican Chair of Division Three, which I'm on, which deals with Housing and Services, worked on it with the Democratic members mm -hmm. of the Finance Committee, and it wasn't the same bill the Senate sent us, but they came out in support of it in a committee of conference. We didn't even have to have that. So that is a, one of the few success stories where we've all really come together yeah and done something that should have been done a long time ago. Very good. Well, this seems like a, a, a good place to end. Um, so I want to thank you all for coming. Thank you. Um, I think this was very informative. And certainly, I would encourage anyone who has interest or questions to get in touch with these four ladies who are doing lots of great work for us in Concord. Um, and thank you all for coming. And I think we'll close right there. Thanks very okay. much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah.